chapter is a, is a warning chapter. And we start out in verse number one with a warning. And, and tonight's sermon is a warning. And Sunday nights, I, if anything, Sunday nights are a little more of a Bible study here. I mean, it's, we, 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 we go a little bit more in depth and try to learn something. And it's the strong meat of the Bible. And, and uh, tonight's sermon is, is controversial. You know, and, and good night, two controversial sermons in one day. I know, I'm sorry. But tonight's sermon... It may not be the funnest sermon. It may not be the most dynamic sermon. It may not go in the record book and say, boy, the best sermon that I ever heard from Pastor Anderson was, was on that Sunday. But I'm going to tell you something. This sermon could mean the difference between you or someone that you love's life being destroyed forever irreparably. You've got to listen and learn the sermon. I'm telling you, you need to hear it. Okay, and so it may not be the, the 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 funnest thing, but you've got to know this. I wouldn't be preaching it if it weren't the most important thing that we need to hear tonight, and I mean that. But here's the warning: it says in verse number one, but there were also there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be. Now that's a promise. That's not a might. You may have these kind of people. You better watch out for them. He says, no, you will come into contact with them. You will have them among you. You will eat a meal with them. Later on we see feasting with you. You will have them in church. You will be around them. They will be there among you. They were back then. They'll be for you. And he says, Who privily, secretly, shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Now, you say, oh, you're talking about false doctrine, false teachers. That's not even what I'm talking about today. Because I'm going to show you something tonight, and, and I've, I've shown this before, but I'm going to go a little more in depth and take a little bit of a different direction. We're not just talking about somebody who's a false teacher. We're not just talking about somebody who teaches false doctrine about the Bible. That's what we talked about in verses 1 and 2. Oh, yes, damnable heresies, false teaching, false prophets. But I'm going to show you something that the false prophet... And the pervert, the predator, let's call me, you know, I want to be sensitive because there's kids here, you know. The predator, yes, they're out there. The deviant, the sicko, are one and the same. I'm going to prove it to you tonight in the Bible. We're going to see it in, in uh, Second Peter, and we're going to see it in Jude. We're going to see it, I, I have a whole list of places that we're going to see it. And I'm trying to keep it simple, and I'm trying to stay on target here. But you got to understand something. There's a concept in the Bible that we're going to talk about. And the way that I'm going to envelop it for you, and the way that I'm going to help you to understand it, is we're going to talk about bad trees. That's what the sermon is about. If you wanted to put a, a title on the sermon or know what the sermon is about, it's about bad trees that bring forth evil fruit. That's what we're going to talk about, the bad trees. Now, you have to understand as going into this that 2 Peter chapter 2 and Jude are parallel passages. I mean, if you've read the Bible a lot, you must have understood and noticed that there are many, many, many exact quotes from 2 Peter chapter 2 in the book of Jude. We talk about the angels being cast down to hell. We talk about Sodom and Gomorrah being condemned with an overthrow. We talk about uh, people who are twice dead, trees whose fruit withereth, plucked up by the roots, uh, waves, raging waves of the sea foaming out their own shame. The same things are taught here. Now look, in chapters 2, verse 1 and 2, we saw false prophets. But go down a little bit. And we're talking about number six, turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemn them with an overthrow. Now put your finger there and flip over to Jude. And we're going to see the same thing over in the book of Jude. Now I'm, I'm building the foundation for the sermon. And there's a lot of things that I want to teach you. Now we're just going to go line upon line and precept upon precept and learn this. But look, if you would, at verse number six of... Jude, and we're going to see that these two passages are talking about the same kind of people, the same bad trees. And if we understand that, we can see the correlation. Look at verse six, uh, verse 7. rather. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. You say, why do you call the homosexuals queers? Because they're strange. That's what the Bible says. Queer means strange. And so it says here they're going after strange flesh are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Look at the next word. Likewise. What does likewise mean? In the same way. The same way. Likewise. Also, 
these filthy dreamers, the ones that we're talking about, the bad people we're talking about, they defile the flesh in the same way, are you seeing this, as the people in Sodom and Gomorrah defiled the flesh. Do you follow that? We saw, they went after strange flesh in Sodom. He said, likewise also these filthy dreamers defile the flesh, despise dominion, and speak evil of dignities. In, the, in 2 Peter 2 it said, despise government, despise dominion. They hate any authority in their life. They don't want God to tell them what to do. They don't want the Bible to tell them what's right. It talks about Michael the archangel bringing railing accusations. We saw that in 2 Peter 2. Look at verse 10. But these speak evil of those things which they know not, but what they know naturally as brute beasts, in those things they corrupt themselves. Flip over to 2 Peter 2. As brute beasts. Okay, look down at your Bible in 2 Peter chapter 2 at verse 12. But these as natural brute beasts, same thing, made to be taken and destroyed, speak evil of the things that they understand not, and shall utterly perish in their own corruption. Flip back to Jude. He says, Woe unto them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and ran greedily after the error of Balaam for reward, and perished in the gain, saying of Cory, These are spots in your feast of charity when they feast with you. Remember, they're going to be among you, feeding themselves without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit withereth. Remember that phrase. Remember this phrase. Without fruit, twice dead. Remember the phrase, twice dead. Okay? Twice dead, plucked up by the roots, raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Look at verse number 16, or verse 17. Let's see here. I'm sorry, I got the wrong place. Yeah, verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouth speaking great swelling words, having men's person and aberration because of advantage. Look down at verse 18. Look at the last two words. Ungodly lusts. Look at verse 19. Sensual. Flip back to 2 Peter chapter 2. We're going down the list here. He says at first that they're teaching false doctrine. They're bringing in damnable heresies. They're denying the Lord that bought them. See, Jesus died for everybody. He's the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. So he's, he's, he's died for everybody. He bought them. He paid for them, but they rejected salvation. But not only are they a false teacher, look at verse 14. Having eyes full of adultery. Do you see that? And that cannot cease from sin. Beguiling unstable souls. Like a small child, for example. Somebody who's not firm in what they believe. Somebody who is not educated in things of the world. And heart they have exercised with covetous practices. Cursed children. They've gone in the way of Balaam, who was an apostate preacher. They're wells without water, verse 17. Clouds carried with a tempest, to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. On and on, on. I, I, I can't, for sake of time, go on and on about this, but you've got to get these two chapters, put them side by side, and you'll notice that the author of, of, of the Bible, the Holy Spirit here, using Peter, using Jude, he's expressing the same thing. He's going back and forth saying, they're, they're sneaking in, they're preaching false doctrine, they're destroying people's lives. Because of them, people are speaking evil of the way of truth. They give Christianity a bad name. They, they, they hurt children. They hurt unstable souls. It's not just teaching the Bible wrong. It's not just lying about salvation. But they're actually committing adultery. They're actually lusting and, and fulfilling the lusts of their uncleanness. They're actually defiling their bodies with other people in the same way that they did in Sodom. Are you following what we're talking about now? We're talking about bad trees. You say, who is the bad tree? Well, let's study it. Look over, if you would, at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30. Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 30. You see, listen to me. Do you think it's a coincidence that the guy who turns his collar backwards and preaches damnable heresy. I mean, he preaches that salvation is by works. I mean, he preaches that Mary is the mother of God. I mean, he preaches idolatry. 
He preaches everything that's heathen and wrong. Is it any coincidence that he's the same guy who's molesting little boys? Is it any coincidence that he's a homosexual? No. We do, I mean, if you really would sit down and read with an honest heart, 2 Peter 2 and Jude, it would not even surprise you for one minute. You say, well, I read about this guy in the Bible. He's a pervert. He, his eyes are full of adultery. He can't even stop. He cannot cease from sin. He's defiling unstable souls, beguiling unstable souls. He defiles his body just like they did back in Sodom. He's a false prophet. He's a false teacher. He's a damnable heretic. Look, if you knew the Bible, you'd see it and you'd say, well, of course. Of course he's perverted. He's wearing a dress. His color is backwards. And he's preaching lies and he's perverted in the bedroom. These things go together, my friend. They're not separate. Now, look, look if you would, at Jeremiah 6.30. And, you know, this is controversial preaching, but I'm telling you, we've got to wake up. For your children's sake, wake up. Okay, for your people that you love, your cousins, your 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 nephews, your nieces, uh, your your friends and family, wake up to the truth about this. Jeremiah six thirty. The Bible says this. This is the first time that the word reprobate is used in the Bible. Who's heard that word before? Put up your hands. That sounds about reprobate. Okay, the word reprobate means rejected, reject. Now God is He's really good about teaching us words in the Bible. Like usually, if you go to the first time a word's mentioned in the Bible, God will teach you what it means. Look, this is the first time reprobate used. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. Okay? So people who God rejects are called reprobates. Now, what's the illustration here? Finding silver. You take silver, you boil it off, and you get rid of the dross. You get rid of all the, the dirt and the, the refuse, and some of the silver becomes junk, and you must throw it away. It's reprobate silver. It's trash. It's gone. It's done. There's nothing you can do with it. You reject it. You say it's junk. Now look, if you would, at Romans chapter 1. We'll go to the most common chapter, the most famous chapter about reprobates. Romans chapter 1. And uh, this is all foundation for the sermon for what I really want to get into. But look at Romans chapter 1. The Bible says in Romans 1, in verse number 18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. They hold the truth, I'm holding the truth right now, in unrighteousness. You got that so far? They possess the truth. They've heard the truth. They've known the truth. But they hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and God it, so that they are without excuse. Watch the next word. Because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, but became, I'm sorry, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Now wait a minute. When they knew God and glorified him not as God, whose fault was that? Their fault, Right? Who made the decision not to glorify God? They did. Who made the decision to not be thankful? They did. Who made the decision to become vain in their imaginations? Their wild imagination that was only on evil continually. Who made that decision? They did. But look at the next verse there. Or the next words. And their foolish heart was darkened. Who's doing the action there? It's not them anymore. That's a that's a trans that's an I'm sorry. That's a transitive passive verb. The subject is receiving the action, not doing the action, okay? So, they weren't thankful, they did this, they did that, and then their heart was darkened by someone else. Who do you think it was that darkened their heart? If you know the Bible, it's God that darkened their heart, okay? And we will see that a little bit later. But it says here, their foolish heart was darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That's their fault, that's their doing. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men. Are they religious people? Yes. They didn't say, well, we, we just threw out the concept of God. No. They changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible men. That's an idol of a human being, a person saying, this is Jesus. This is God. Okay? And, not only that, they took it a step further. And to birds. And four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore... God also gave them up 
to uncleanness. Now, who gave them? Did they, did they decide to give up on themselves? No. They were vain. They perverted the truth. They twisted God's image into an animal, into a man. They became vain in their imaginations. God darkened their heart and gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own eyes. Now look, I don't care what you've heard or what you've thought. You can't look at this verse and understand anything different in verse 24. Look down at verse 24. God gave them up to uncleanness. Why did they go into uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts? Because God gave them up to it. That's what it says. Okay, And then it says, to dishonor their own bodies between themselves. Now that's a physical immorality. But then back, we're back to doctrine again. Verse 25. Who changed the truth of God into a lie. And worshipped and served the creature more than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. Why? Because they changed the truth of God into a lie. Hold your finger here. Flip over to Revelation 22. I realize we're covering a lot of ground, but we've got to get this real firm in our minds to grasp the rest of the sermon. Revelation 22. You see, when you change God's truth into a lie, God gives you up. That's what it says. Okay, It says, they changed the truth of God into a lie. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. We're going to find out what that is in a moment. Look down at Revelation 22. It says in verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life, and out of the holy city, and from the things which are written in this book. Could it be any simpler? Could there be any other meaning for what we just read in Revelation 22? That if you change God's word into a lie. I mean, like, for example, these modern Bible versions, where they took the Bible, they changed it. I mean, they added, they took away verses, they added verses, they took away words, they added words. They took something that was very true. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth, the Bible says. Thy word is the truth. They turn it into a lie. Because if it says, Jesus saith unto him, and it wasn't what he said, then it's a lie. And so they twisted the, the God's word. They took things out. They added to it. God says, if you do that, you're going to hell. You're damned forever. Okay. You say, well, you believe in losing your salvation? Of course not. Nobody who's saved would do that. Okay. You, you say, well, was, why would a saved person do that? Because the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we're the children of God. And the Bible says that the Holy Spirit will lead you into all truth. Now, you can quench the Spirit, grieve the Spirit, go out into sin, drink, smoke, party, fornicate, and, and you're still saved. You can be like Samson, you know, going to prostitutes and all these wicked things. But I'm going to tell you something. You still know the truth in your heart. I mean, we could talk to people in this room right now who got saved as a child or who got saved maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, and they went to the world, and they lived in sin, and they drank, and they fornicated, and they, they took drugs, or whatever the case may be. But I'm going to tell you something. Those people knew that they were saved while they were doing those things. And they knew they said, they would have said, I'm backslidden. I'm ungodly. I'm away from God. But if you would have asked them, hey, is the blood of Jesus Christ the only way to heaven? They would have said yes. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is there to say, my friend. I mean, he's there testifying to them. And so, here, these people who would willfully change and twist God's word, God says, you crossed the line. Your part is blotted out from the book of life. It's, you're done. I mean, he says, you took, you took something out of the Bible? I mean, you had the audacity to change my word? He said, you're done. You're part of the holy city, that mansion that could have been for you. It's done. It's gone. It's too late for you. There are people walking on this earth, and you, you can believe it or not, there are people who walk on this earth, and there are a lot of them. They're, they're the evil trees that we're going to learn about. And we're going to see how God likens them to trees over and over again. They're bad trees because they've been rejected by God. Now, does God just reject people? No, no, no. He rejects people who twist the Bible. He rejects people who change the truth of God into a lie. He rejects people who are vain in their imaginations, 
who, who allow themselves to be darkened, who go into the wickedness, immorality, and want, don't want to retain God in their knowledge. They don't want to hear the truth. They've heard the truth and rejected it. God says, I give you a chance, I'll give you a second chance, I'll give you a third chance, fourth chance, fifth chance, and finally, he has to just say, I'm done with you. You're rejected. Look, if you would, we saw that in Revelation 22 very clearly. Pretty simple. Pretty simple stuff, folks. Let's look at Romans chapter 1. And uh, I'm trying to keep it as simple as I can tonight, because it's really, you know, the Bible is a deep book, and there's a lot of teaching. Let's get back to Romans 1. They changed the truth of God into a lie. Here's an example of that. Revelation 22 is one way that that could take place. Uh, look at verse 26. For this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections. Now, the word vile means disgusting, right? If I said, oh, it's so vile, it's putrefied, it's gross, it's ugh. Disgusting, revolting. You know, that's isn't that what vile means? For even their women, for is a conjunction. Okay, we're, we're, we're connecting the thought here. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise, which means again in the same way, also the men leaving the natural use of the woman. They're not leaving the woman completely. They're leaving the natural use of the woman. They're still going to use women, and, and I, I'll show you that in another place. But it says, burned in their lust one toward another. What? Men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. Remember Grandma's Bible? I love to preach out of my grandma's Bible because she has it all marked up, written. She wrote all this stuff and she gave me. I said, Grandma, because she's got a new one that she's had going for the last couple of years ever since she gave me out. I said, Grandma, just put one thing in the will for me. I don't want any money. I don't want any stuff. I said, I want your Bible to work out right now. I said, give it to me because I'll use it. And she said she would. And so uh, she wrote right under that where it says, Receiving in themselves that recompense their other was meet. I was preaching out of Grandma's Bible when I preached on the book of Jude. It said AIDS. That's what she wrote. Okay. Get mad at Grandma. She said, she just had written in red letters, AIDS. I was like, man, I love my Grandma. And so uh, it says, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. What is even as? In the same way, right? Just like they didn't want to remember God. Just like they didn't want anything to do with God. They didn't even want to think about God. They said, I want to push God and his word as far out of my mind as I can. Because I'm rejecting Jesus. He says, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, what does reprobate mean? We learned it in Jeremiah 6.30. He rejected them. He turned them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You say, convenient? What's convenient mean? Well, it comes from Latin. The word con in Latin means with. The word vin is like uh, Spanish. Venir means to come. Okay, venere in Latin. Uh, it doesn't come naturally. It doesn't come easily. I mean, convenient. It's not convenient like who in their right mind, who in the world would dream of such filth? It's not natural. That's why a few verses previous he said it's against nature. Look, it's not, you say, well, everybody has a sin nature. You're right, everybody does have a sin nature. I was born in sin, and in iniquity did my mother conceive me. And I have a sin nature. You know what comes naturally to me? Stealing. Lying. Right? I've got to renew my mind. We were talking about this before the service. I can't, if, I, if I don't renew my mind, I'm going to be conformed to the world. Romans 12, 2. What comes naturally to me is what's wrong. I mean, do you think I teach my kids to lie? Son, let me teach you how to lie. If you're going to get in trouble, if it's bad, just lie. Just say what's on the not true. They naturally know how to lie. They naturally know how to sin. They naturally do wrong. You, we have to teach them and train them again to do right. A child left to himself will bring his mother to shame, the Bible says. And so you've got to train people to do right. What's natural is to do wrong. What's natural is to steal. What's natural is to lie. What's natural is to uh, lust. What's natural is to commit fornication. Unless you bridle that passion and say, I will not defile my body. I'm going to do right. Is homosexuality natural? Do I walk down the street and say, oh, I better not lust after another guy today? Are you kidding? Oh, man. I'm really being tempted here. There's a billboard with a guy with no shirt on. you got to be kidding me. 
Now look, I'll tell you right now. Any man knows that if there's a if there was a billboard of a scantily clad woman, he's gonna be tempted to look at that billboard. But if he's right with God, he's gonna say, I'll set no wicked thing before my eyes. Right? And he's gonna control his eyes, control his thoughts, control his mind. But is there a temptation? Yes. The temptation is there. We gotta resist the temptation. We gotta try to not even be led in. Lead us not temptation. The ways you pray to Jesus, okay? But Sir, are you tempted with other guys? No, you're not. No. Is any normal guy tempted by another man? No. Ladies, are you tempted to be a lesbian? No. Because that's not natural. It's unnatural. It's against nature, and it's not part of our sin nature. Sin is natural to, to, the, to a man and to a woman, but uh, sodomy is unnatural. It's against nature. The only way that people can get like that is when God just says, I'm going to give you over to do whatever. You say, well, did God dream it up? No, God's not sick. God gave them up to their own. It says, he gave them up through the lust. Go back in your verse here. You see this in verse number uh, 24. we got to get this very carefully. It says, he gave them up to uncleanness through the lusts of their own heart. So he basically just turns them over to filthy, vile affections. He just takes away any humanity from their mind that would tell them what's normal and natural. And he basically just turns them over to these vile affections that they dream up in their own mind. And it's not just homosexuality, because there's other things I'm not going to mention that are lit. If you want to read about them, read them in Leviticus chapter 18. And it describes other really weird stuff that people do. And it's all those things. It's just all the vile affections. All the filthy weirdo stuff. Uh, children, whatever you want to name. And I'm going to tell you something. Nobody's a sodomite who's not a reprobate. Take or leave it, it's the truth. Uh, nobody is a child molester that's not a reprobate. It's not natural for a man to lust after children, female or male. It's weird. It's reprobate. You've been turned over to filth. You've been rejected by God. Now, I, and you know what? You won't hear that. In, and, I mean, I don't know. If, I couldn't even name you five Baptist churches where you'll hear that thought. But you're sitting in one right now. You've arrived. <laughs> but anyway, uh, look if you would at, at uh, Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to start to talk about these bad trees. Now, why does God liken them to trees? You say, well, I can't figure out what you're preaching about, Pastor Anderson. Are you preaching about homos? Are you preaching about <coughs> pedophiles? Are you preaching about people who infiltrate churches? And, and uh, You don't get it. It's all the same person. Okay, and that's what we're going to see. Look at Hebrews chapter 6. Now, why is God likening them to trees? Well, because trees produce fruit. And we're going to talk about what it means to produce fruit. Trees produce fruit. Good trees always bring forth good fruit. Corrupt trees always bring forth evil fruit. Now, God called them trees whose fruit wither. Remember that? Look at Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to see a similar teaching here. And we're going to compare this with Matthew 7. Hebrews 6 says, in verse 4, For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, they knew the truth, just like they knew it in Romans chapter 1, they were once enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come. Now, are these people saved? No. But they've tasted it. They've understood it. They've been enlightened by it. They've uh, been a partaker of the Holy Ghost's conviction on them. I mean, the Holy Ghost was speaking to their heart. They've been enlightened. It says that they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance... See, he said, it's impossible. You know, going back to the original noun and verb of the sentence. It's impossible if they shall fall away to renew them again unto repentance. Repentance means to change your mind. They can't change and go back. He says, seeing they crucified themselves, the Son of God afresh, and put him to an open shame. For the earth which drinketh in the rain that cometh oft upon it, and bringeth forth herbs meet for them by whom it is dressed, receiveth blessing from God. But that which beareth, listen to this, that which beareth 
thorns and briars is rejected. Remember that word rejected? That which beareth thorns and briars is rejected and is nigh unto cursing whose end is to be burned. People who were once enlightened, they tasted of the heavenly gift. They were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. They rejected it. They turned away from it. He said, you're not going to renew them to repent. You're not going to be able to change them. You, it's too late for them. He says they're going to be burned. They're going to go to hell. And he said they're going to bear thorns and briars and they've been rejected. They're reprobate. Look at Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter number 7, and, and while you're turning there, let me, let me jog your memory of some things that we saw when we were back in 2 Peter chapter 2. We, we're jumping around a lot, but the Bible just talks so much about the subject in so many different places. Remember, it, be, it says, once they've fallen away, you can't get them back. Listen to this. It had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. This is in 2 Peter 2. Same crowd. Then after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment, Delivered unto them. It'd be better if they never even heard the gospel, he's saying, than to hear it and reject it and become a reprobate. But it's happened to them, according to the true proverb, the dog has turned to his vomit again. Now, here we are in uh, Matthew chapter 7. Very familiar passage and extremely misunderstood passage. I hope you'll, you'll listen carefully and, and, and uh, we can get this straight here. It says in verse number 15, Beware of false prophets. Now, what did we start out talking about in 2 Peter 2? There were false prophets among them. But then he started going into how perverted they were with adultery, with uh, abusing children, uh, children, unstable souls. It even mentions children as well, cursed children. And uh, we saw that they were committing adultery, they were lustful, they were sensual, ungodly lust, turned over to their own heart's lust, in addition to being a false prophet and a false teacher. Watch this. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing. They're among you. You don't realize you're eating with them. They're sitting next to you in church. Not tonight, thank God, but I'm just saying in general. And he says, but inwardly there are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Now remember the thing that bears thorns and briars, the bad tree of Hebrews chapter 6. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Thorns and thistles? You following this? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. But a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth fruit, good fruit. I'm sorry, let me get back to it. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit. Neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Remember, their end is to be burned. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Now, who are we going to know by their fruits? People will say, Oh, is so-and-so saved? Well, by their fruits ye shall know them. Does this say you'll know who's saved by their fruits? No. Who are you going to know by their fruits? False prophets. Look at it. Verse 15. Beware of false prophets. Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Who's the them? False prophets. You'll know them by their fruits. How do you know the false prophets? By their fruits. How do you know who's saved? Because they say with their mouth the Lord Jesus say, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What was it that... Philip needed to be convinced of before he baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. Want to be baptized? Sure. No, he said, no. If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. Now, is that true or not? You think Philip was wrong when he said that? If thou believest with thine own heart. Well, but they didn't go through the ten-week class. Well, but he's got long hair. Well, but he's living with his girlfriend. No, what does the Bible say is the criteria for baptism? If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said to him, and he, how did he know he believed? He said, well, I'm going to watch you a while and make sure you really believe. <laughs> he said, tell me right now whether you believe this, what I'm preaching to you right now. Tell me if you believe that Jesus is the only way to heaven. Tell me if you believe that it's eternal and you can't lose it and that it's all by faith in Christ. You believe that? Okay, baptized. Now, how do you know if people are saved? Here's the answer. You don't really know who's saved, right? I mean, can you really know for sure. Some people you can know for sure. But you know what? A lot of people you might think they're saved and they turn out not to be saved, right? Because you can't really see inside their heart. <coughs> Does that make sense to you? I know I'm saved, you know? Do I necessarily know that every Christian that I know is saved? I don't know. But how do you know the false prophet? That's where you look at the fruits. Now, I've heard people say this statement. Well, a Christian, if there's no fruit, they're not saved. Because every Christian is going to bring forth fruit. Wrong. And again, I'm, this is review, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But Genesis 1 is where you start. Every 
thing brings forth fruit after its own kind. Fruit after its own kind. Again and again and again. And then after it gets done telling us that plants bring forth fruit after their own kind. Trees bring forth fruit. Animals bring forth fruit after their own kind. Then he says to man, be fruitful. What do you mean by that, God? What do you mean to be fruitful? Should I go to work and work really hard? Oh, he's a really fruitful employee. Or should, am I going to sprout branches and, and produce fruit? What did he mean when he said be fruitful? Well, all you have to do is read two more words. Be fruitful and multiply. So what does it mean to be fruitful? To multiply. If my wife and I are fruitful, which we are, number five is on the way, okay? Hey, the number of people in our family is multiplied. Okay? Now, have you ever noticed, looking at my children, how much they look like me? And have you ever noticed how much they look like my wife? That's because everything brings forth after its own kind. You know? Um, have you ever noticed that if, if, if you got to know some of the people that go to church here, okay, you'd notice that they're a lot like me. You know? Like, if, if you talk to them. I mean, my, my sister talked to, uh, I think she talked to you. Amanda, about something about uh, your, your relative in Farmington or something. And she's like, wow. It was like talking to you, Steve. <laughs> That's what she said. She said, wow, I talked to Amanda. It was a lot like talking to you. You know? And if you talk to people in this church, they're going to remind you uh, sometimes of me. And, and you know what? If you met some of the people that have influenced me, like you met my friend Mike Ramsey I was talking about, and if you met like uh, my former pastor in California and stuff, you, if you sat down and listened to him preach, you'd say, wow, that, that reminds me a lot of Pastor Anderson. Okay? Now, look, people bring forth after their own kind. Now, my wife and I have produced children that are like us. Now, a fruit tree brings forth fruit after its own kind. A lemon tree produces lemons. An orange tree produces oranges. A pineapple, a uh, palm tree, or I don't know, I'm, uh, forgive me for bringing up a fruit that I don't understand completely. But I think it grows on a palm tree. Okay? but not in Arizona. If you plant a seed in the ground and the tree grows up, maybe it's just a little bit of a tree and you see the leaves and everything. I mean, can you really identify the difference between an orange tree and a grapefruit tree by looking at the leaves? Now, some people probably could, but you know what? If I wanted to know what kind of tree it was, I'd wait and check what the fruit is, right? I mean, when we first moved into our house, we had a tree. I didn't know what it was. But when the fruit started growing on, I said, it's an apple tree, because there's apples all over it. Well, are you sure? Well, yeah, look at it, man. There's apples all over it. You can tell it's an apple tree. Now, think about this. Is a, if a Christian is to bring forth fruit, that means he's reproducing himself. That means he's multiplying. That means that he's winning somebody to Christ. Okay? I mean, if you just break it down to its simplest form. I mean, if I am going to... Bring forth fruit as a Christian, it means I won somebody to Christ. I multiplied. I gave birth. Paul said, I, I've given birth to you. He said, I travail in birth to bring you forth. He said, I've begotten Onesimus in my bonds. He says, Timothy, my own son in the faith. It wasn't his physical son. He said, you've many masters, but he said, you only have one father to the church of Corinth. He said, I've begotten you. I'm your dad spiritually because I gave birth to you. I'm the one who won you to Christ, what he's saying. And so you bring forth after your own kind. Christians produce Christians. Lemons produce lemons. Are you following this? People will say, oh, he quit drinking. He's bringing forth fruit. I mean, come on, folks. That, is, that defies all scientific logic. Oh, he, he went to church. I guess he brought forth fruit. You don't have to be saved to go to church. You don't have to be saved to quit drinking. Have you ever heard of a 12-step program? Okay? Have you ever heard of Alcoholics Anonymous? You can quit drinking without being saved. You can go to church without being saved. You can read the Bible without being saved, right? You can get on your knees and pray without being saved. You can clean up your life. You can get a haircut without being saved. Hey, there's only one thing that you can't do when you're not saved, and it's win somebody to Christ. That's the only thing that an unsaved person can do. You know, if you've never won anybody to the Lord, you're not much different than unsaved people. Because the only thing in the world that you can do when you're saved that you can't do when you're not saved is to win somebody to Christ. You say, well, I believe unsaved people can win people to Christ. They can't because they can't. you've got to bring forth after your own kind. You've got to be one to produce one. You've got to be a Christian to give birth to a Christian. I give birth to human beings because I am a human being, 
Okay, I don't give birth to them, thank God, but I produce them. My wife gives birth to them. But yay, she gives birth to human beings because she's human. If she were not a human, she'd be incapable of producing human children. I know this is really deep and, and uh, really high-level theology, but things produce after their own kind. Genesis 1. So when the Bible is talking about bringing forth fruit, it's talking about multiplying. It's talking about reproducing yourself. Also, bringing forth fruit. Well, I don't, I don't want to get, I don't want to get off on a tangent. But think about this for a moment. If an apple, and I'm going to be real quick with this because this is repetition. But if an apple is eaten and thrown in the trash, was it still an apple even though it never produced apples? Yes. Okay. Now, out of all the apples that grow in the orchard and fall on the ground, how many of them become apple trees? One in a hundred? One in a thousand? Right? And if you ever notice that when God says they bring forth fruit, he said some 30, some 60, some 100. That's a quantity. That's not love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's his fruit. He reproduced that for his His God is love. He's the oil of gladness. He's the prince of peace. He produced that for his own kind. But when you bring forth fruit, it, it can be quantified into numbers like 30, 60, 100. Okay? Just like you can count apples. You can count oranges on a tree. Look, if an apple never falls to the ground, dies, becomes buried in soil, watered, it's never going to become an apple tree. But it was still an apple. And you can be still a Christian even if you never become a Christian tree. Okay? The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that winneth souls is wise. That's what fruit is. Now, let's say you take that apple and bury it in the ground, however. It will bring forth good fruit. It will not bring forth thorns and briars. You don't plant an apple and get thorns and briars. You plant an apple, you get an apple tree. And you know what was planted when you look at the fruit on the tree. You'll say, I know that was an apple because I buried it in the ground and an apple tree grew up. And if I see, uh, if I plant an unknown seed and I put it in the ground and it produces thorns and briars and withering fruit, I say, that was a bad seed. Does that make sense to you? So not every saved person is a fruit-producing tree. And not every unsaved person is an evil tree producing corrupt fruit. But those who are twice dead, as it said in the book of Jude, I mean, I didn't come up with that term, twice dead, trees whose fruit wither. Like people who are made twofold more the child of hell as yourselves. I've heard people say that every unsaved person is a child of the devil. No, that's not true. Only time in the Bible that God, ever, Jesus ever told anybody that they were of the devil. Turn to John chapter 8. John chapter number 8. Man, the Bible is so consistent. Look at John 8. This is the only time God ever tells anybody that their father is the devil in the whole Bible. Look at John 8, 44. Year of your father the devil, be speaking to the Pharisees, and the lusts of your father ye will do. Now, isn't it interesting that the Pharisees who are religious false teachers are now being associated with lust? Isn't that interesting? He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Now flip over to John. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. Look down at, at verse 47. He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because you're not of God. Now look at John 12. John chapter 12. And look down at verse number 37, talking about the same people. Just a few chapters later, the same crowd. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. That the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Watch this next phrase. Therefore, they could not believe. Because that Isaiah said again, He, who's he, God, he hath blinded their eyes. Why couldn't the Pharisees believe on Jesus? Look, man, it says because God has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. They couldn't believe because God darkened their heart. God blinded their eyes. They couldn't believe on Jesus. Why? 
because they were reprobates. Why do you think Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God? The hyper-Calvinist will try to, or any kind of Calvinist, I'm, I'm against all of it. I'm against like a, a hypo-Calvinist, if, you, if you're smart enough to know what hypo and hypo mean. You know, hypo means under, like too little, too much. Hey, I'm just a negative Calvinist. I'm just a non-Calvinist. Are you Calvinist or Arminian? Hey, they're both straight out of hell. I don't believe in either. I don't believe you can lose your salvation, and I don't believe that you have to persevere to prove that you were really saved, like the Calvinists teach. I believe in eternal security. Praise God. You can never lose your salvation. That's what I believe. And neither the Calvinists nor Arminians really believe that, if you really boil it down. That's a whole other sermon. But you got to understand here, Pharaoh is the one who first hardened his heart. You remember? Who is the Lord? I'm not going to let his people go. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Pharaoh hardened his heart. Toward the end, it stopped saying that. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. God hardened the Pharisees' heart. You know why? Because in Matthew chapter 12, and I mean, we're going so many places, but I'm, you know, when I'm preaching on this subject, I'm like a kid in a candy store because there's so many places to go. It's like, where do I go? It's taught in every book of the Bible. But look at Matthew chapter 12. This is why they couldn't believe. This is why God darkened their heart. This is why their foolish dark heart was darkened. Look at Matthew 12, 31. The same crowd, the Pharisees. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Did you get that? Neither in this world... Neither in the world to come. Hey, you're going to be shocked by what we read in the next words. Either make the tree good. Wow, we're talking about trees again. Isn't this interesting? <laughs> it just comes up every pa Hebrews 6, 2 Peter 2, uh, on and on. Uh, Jude, everywhere, same thing. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and its fruit corrupt, for the tree is known by its fruit. Okay, are you getting it? Very simple. O oh, generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? What does that mean? You're incapable of speaking good things. You cannot speak good things. Now he says, how can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. A good man, out of the good treasure of the heart, bringeth forth good things, and an evil man, out of the evil treasure, bringeth forth evil things. Did you know that there are evil people in this world? This is what we're talking about. Bad trees. Evil trees. They're evil. Oh, love them. They're bad. They're evil. We live in a world that wants to say nobody's evil. Nobody's bad. Everybody's good. It's just their environment. We just love everybody. Okay, do you love Jeffrey Dahmer? Get out of my sight if you love Jeffrey Dahmer, you weirdo. Let me guess you just love Adolf Hitler. What if, I, what if I had a sticker on the back of my car that said, I love Hitler. I love Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, I love everybody. What is wrong with you? Hey, uh, let's call up some of the victims of these pedophiles. And you know what? You can't go one week in Arizona, in Phoenix, get the Arizona Republic. Every week there will be, there will be ped pedophiles that are getting caught. And you know, most pedophiles don't get caught. You know why they don't get caught? And this is a side note to the sermon. You know why the pedophiles don't get caught? Because I've known several people that I've been close to in my life who've been molested. And you know what happened when they came out with it and, and said, this person molested me, this, this relative molested me, or this teacher molested me, or whatever. You know what happened when they came out with it? Nobody believed them. Isn't that, isn't that sad? That's what happens. Because I'm, I'm going to tell you something. People are molested and defiled. And they're ashamed to even tell anybody about it. They're scared to tell anybody about it. Because, and I used to wonder, like, hearing about this, like, 20 years later, these girls will come out, you know, when they're in their 30s, saying, this is what happened to me when I was in elementary school. And, and this is when I was abused. And people coming out with 20 years. I thought, why didn't they come out with it back then? Why didn't they just say it? But I've since learned why. Because nobody believes them. Nobody wants to hear about it. Everybody wants to sweep it under the rug. Nobody wants to believe it. 
And they come out and say, I was molested. And it's like, you're lying. You say, people do that? I, everybody I've ever known who was molested, more than half the people didn't believe it. And to this day, hate them and say, oh, they're a liar. It's so common. I mean, it's so common. Even the world will tell you that 25% of girls, by the time they graduate from high school, have been molested in some way. It's so common. You say, why is it so common? Well, this is what we're learning about tonight. We're learning about trees. Trees are very productive. Did you know that? They're reproductive. Now, my life is given to the task of winning as many people to the Lord as I can. Reproducing, right? My goal is to... Remember what we talked about this morning, the exponents, where we talked about like two people, then four, then eight, then ten, and we could win... Win uh, thousands of people to the Lord just by soul winning, just, just by one-on-one -on -one soul winning. Remember we talked about that this morning? My goal is to not just get somebody saved. That's a blessing, but really the, what I really want to do is get that person saved and teach them to be like me. Now, you don't have to be just like me, but just to win souls like I win souls. And then it can multiply. These bad trees, these pedophiles, these sodomites, and every sodomite's a pedophile. Get my sermon on the sodomites, and I go through that in detail. We'll prove from the Bible. These pedophiles, these sodomites, these gays, they're not reproducers, they're recruiters. They can't physically reproduce. Here's a biology lesson for you. They're both men. They're not going to have any children. They reproduce through molestation. They reproduce by beguiling unstable souls. They reproduce by uh, hurting children. They reproduce by forcing people against their will. Read it in Genesis chapter 9. Read it in Genesis 19. Read it in Judges 19, where they're taking people and forcing them to do something that they don't want to do. Forcing them. Forcing, uh, you know, the, the concubine in, in Judges chapter 19. They tried to force Lot. They said, we're going to do to you what we wanted to do to your visitors. They pressed him against the door, and the angel pulled him in the house, blinded the man, and barely, scarcely saved Lot from being abused by him. They wanted to, to rape those angels. And so what happened was, uh, again and again throughout the Bible, we see the same pattern of the recruiting, the bad tree. He wants to spread his evil fruit. He wants to reproduce in every way possible. He wants to make other people a child of hell like him. The only person in the Bible that was ever called a child of the devil was a reprobate Pharisee. And you see, when you're a child of God, my friend, you'll always be a child of God. Have you ever used that illustration when you're winning somebody to Christ? Hey, once, you're, once, once God's your father, hey, my kids will always be my kids and you'll always be God's son. You have eternal life, you're in the family. Once you're the devil's son, you're always going to be the devil's son. Okay? Because you can't change who your dad is. And once they become that twofold child of hell, once they become that bad, wicked tree, they're rejected. It's too late for them. All they can do is just wait to go to hell. And in the meantime, they're going to do what the devil does. They're going to do what people of Sodom and Gomorrah did. We're going to take as many people as we can with us. You say, I don't understand that mentality. That's because you're not a reprobate. That's because you're not Satan. Why does Satan want to take as many people to hell with him as possible? He does. It doesn't matter why. It's a fact. And so these sodomites, these bad trees, they creep in and they want to defile the innocent crowd. I mean, they got a whole town full of queers in Sodom. Why can't they just go and be queer with each other? No. They said, we're going to find the most godly, righteous people in the town and we're going to abuse them. Why? The same reason why they target children. The same reason why they target churches. And I'm trying to warn you tonight, this could save your children, this could save your loved ones, if you understand to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, is walking about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And it's not just the devil, it's the, his ministers that are transformed as the ministers of life. And they creep in, and they want to they wanna take your kids on an overnight activity. Here's where the rubber meets the road. 
They want to take your kids off somewhere by themselves. In Jude, it says, these be they who separate themselves. Sensual, having not the spirit. They want to get away from the crowd. They want to get you and pull you off by yourself somewhere. Or pull your children off by yourself somewhere. I'm going to tell you something. My kids don't ever leave my sight. Ever. I, get, I got some flack about that. We were in Germany, we were in, and we got some flack about that. Everybody's trying to take our kids here, take them there. I said, my kids are not leaving us. They can be with me, they can be with my wife, that's it. Period. Because I'm sick and tired of hearing about all the people getting molested and abused. Because you said, I mean, I've been to churches where they wanted me to drop my kid off overnight with somebody that I'd never even met. Oh, but they go to our church. I said, I wouldn't drop... Okay, would you drop off a suitcase of a million dollars with these people that you've never met? My kids are worth more to me than a million dollars. I want to keep my kids safe. I want to protect my kids. Let me tell you something. These churches and these liberal churches, these new evangelical churches... Let me just sit down and talk to you for a second. Okay, these liberal churches, they're filled with sodomites. Yes, they are. They are. You know how I know that? Because I went to liberal churches from the time I was 12 to 16. For five years, we went to the NIV rock concert Baptist church. And you know what? I sat down in the youth group. And it was so, you know, those churches are so much funner than our church. You know, and, and they're so much more positive. And man, it's just such a more friendly, positive atmosphere sometimes. Because the pastor doesn't say negative things or yell or criticize anybody or anything. It's very friendly, very positive, very accepting. And um, just really happy and upbeat. I mean, the music is real upbeat. Not singing some Netherlands song from like 300 years ago, you know. I mean, uh, it's, it's just really positive, upbeat. It's fun. It's happy. Everybody's smiling. But you know what? I sat in, this, I sat in the youth group. And I'm thinking of one in particular right now. I'm sitting in the youth group. And uh, a guy in the youth group, a teenage guy, and I was like, I was like 16 at the time. A guy reaches over and puts his hand on me right here, like that. Okay, right here, like that, okay? And he made this real sick look in my eyes. And I said, what are you I mean, isn't that a normal reaction? I said, what are you doing? And you know what he said? <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. I was just, I was just messing with you. And he did it again, another time. Get away from me. And I had another guy do that to me in a different youth group. The same thing. I'm, I mean, I'm, if I'm lying, I'm dying. I'm telling you the truth right now that that's what happened. And I watched him do it to other people. Ah, uh, just kidding. No. Testing the waters. Testing the waters. I watched him do it. I watched him do it at Hiles Anderson College. He's a bunch of sodomites. That place is so filled with queer little sissies. And it's all these pastor's kids. You know why? Because their dad was so busy pastoring that he dropped them off with a bunch of people that he didn't trust, you know, or he shouldn't have trusted. He dropped them off. I, I remember, there's a great preacher, great man of God, and somebody said, why is this kid such a stinking queer? That's what they, I'm, hey, I didn't say that. I'm just quoting that. Okay. My friend said to me, why is this guy's son such a little queer? Why is he such a geek? Why is he such a weirdo? How could he have raised that son, the great man of God that he is? I said, you know why? Because he didn't raise him, that's why. Because the Christian school raised him. Because everybody else raised him. If he would have raised him, his son would be like him. Because everything brings forth after its own kind. The problem is he didn't raise him. He dropped him off and he probably got molested in the, in the Sunday school. I had a friend of mine who, got, who, who almost got sodomized by another guy. It was caught in the nick of time at Hammond Baptist Elementary. Okay? And so, I, you know, I would watch him do it at, at Hal's Anderson. I'm not just saying Hal's Anderson. I mean, it's everywhere. My sister went to Golden State Baptist College. I call it Golden Calf Baptist College in uh, Santa Clara, California. And she went there with, with uh, Dr. Money Bucks Treber. And uh, she went to the college there. And you know what happened? Eleven guys got kicked out the semester she was there for dressing and drag. My sister showed me. She said, hey, look at this. 
She showed me a picture on the internet of guys in the Golden State dorm room, okay? With makeup on, dressed in drag, posing for the camera. Just again and again. In the And you could recognize, she said, look. Because I'd been there to visit her one time, so I kind of knew what the dorms were. She said, look, they're in the dorms of the Bible college. And they're, they're dressed up uh, like they're gay. And, it's, and she said, it's because they are gay. She said, I know who that guy's boyfriend is. He's a sodomite. Literally. I watched him at Hiles Anderson. Um, I remember one time in particular. This guy, I pegged him as a sodomite. I, you know, I could spot him a mile away. And uh, I, I pegged this guy as a sodomite. And uh, he's walking. And I hate to even say this, though. I'm trying to say as little as possible because I don't want to, you know, <coughs> defile anybody by even telling the story. But the guy's walking around. And he's wearing his little pink shirt, you know. And he, uh, yes, I'm going to get his pink shirts. And he bumps into, he bumps into another guy, right? And this other guy was real fruity, too. He bumps into this other guy, and, and, and he looks at the guy, and he says, Hey, you just touched my, you know, I'm not going to say <laughs> Hey, did you know that you accidentally just touched my... And they both just kind of giggled and looked at each other. And I'm just like thinking to myself, these people are just trying to, they're just scouting. Not only are they trying to find each other, one side of my trying to find the other side of my, not only that, but they're also trying to find somebody who's an unstable soul that they can be out. They're trying to find somebody who's weak, okay? Somebody who's weak. Now, look, that guy could tell that I wasn't weak. Because I cursed him out. I said, ah, blankety blank, you know? I said, what are you doing? See, he knew that I wasn't weak. He knew that I wasn't somebody who was, uh, you know, going to go that way. I yelled at him and said, don't ever do that to me again, you freak. Okay? But you know what? They're looking for the unstable soul. Because the guy did it to me several times. He realized it wasn't working. You know, I'm talking about weeks apart. But you know what? They'll keep doing it to somebody and keep doing it to them and do it. Wear them down, wear them down, wear them down. Get them off by themselves and abuse them. You can say it doesn't happen, but every church I've ever been in, I can tell you about how it happened. I can tell you about the song leader of the church that I grew up in. His son's a bouncer at a gay bar now. I can tell you about his best friend. She's a lesbian. These are people that we grew up with in Baptist church. Independent Fundamental Baptist. King James Bible. So it ain't. But go ahead and just drop your kids off and leave your, let your kids run wild. Let your nieces and nephews run wild. But you ought to listen to the warning that I'm giving you right now. That there are people out there whose goal is to get to kids and get to unstable souls and to molest them and to turn them into freaks like they are. They're bad trees. They're reproducing. And you know what? It used to be that they were in the closet. It used to be that there weren't near as many of them. It used to be that when they got caught, they put them in a straitjacket. Put them in jail. When I... I I found a police manual from the 1950s. It had a whole section on, on homos, and it said that they're mentally sick and that they should be arrested because it said that they prey on children. That's what it said in a police manual issued by the government in the 50s. And so you got to understand that in America now, the pastor's afraid to get up and talk about it. You know, I mean, the pastor's afraid. Hey, this pastor's not afraid to get up and talk about it. You know what? Every pastor in America that won't preach about it is part of the problem. Because they parade up and down the street, they walk in and everybody's afraid to even say anything to them. I mean, you watch them walk in, oh, hi, And everybody, nobody says like, hey man, quit being a queer. Nobody says that to them. You know they don't. You see them in the department store. You think anybody tells them, act like a man. Get out of here! Get away from my kids! No, everybody's scared because they want to be politically correct. That's why they dominate TV. That's why if you watch them on TV, you're not right with God. You watch these filthy sitcoms, you're not right with God. You watch these movies that contain a bunch of queers and queer actors, you're not right with God. And I'm going to tell you about it. You watch Keanu Reeves, the sodomite, open sodomite, you're not right with God. You watch Leonardo DiCaprio, who's a sodomite, you're not right with God. Period. And you know what? They dominate TV. They're in the NFL. 
They're in the NBA. They're in the politics. Open sodomites are sitting in the Senate of the United States. And God we trust. They're sitting in the House of Representatives right now. You ever heard of Barney Franks? You ever heard of this, uh, what's this uh, Republican from Idaho? It was uh, caught in the bathroom in Minnesota. What's his name? Nobody knows. Craig. Senator Craig. Right? I don't know what his first name is. Senator Craig. Barney Franks. Bunch of sodomites running our country. Why? Because, listen, if you take something, if you take an animal, because that's what they are. The Bible called them brute beasts, which means beast means animal, brute means stupid. Stupid animals, made to be taken and destroyed, reprobate, trash. If you take an animal and you put it in an environment where it has no natural predators, it'll continue to multiply exponentially. Two, four, eight, sixteen, thirty-two. That's what they're doing in America right now. One sodomite. See, see, you're a Christian, but but you're not winning anybody to Christ. You're not multiplying. You're the end of your family line spiritually. You're the end of the old spiritual family tree. But while you're not going so well, while you're not reproducing after your own kind, the sodomites are, every single one of them. Each sodomite in his lifetime will probably produce another hundred sodomites. That's why God said they need to be killed. Because it, otherwise it's going to spread. He said you've got to just take them and kill them. Stone them to death, their blood shall be upon them. Otherwise it will spread. Otherwise the disease will keep spreading. Otherwise the tree will just keep bringing forth fruit. Blossoming and bringing forth fruit. Bringing forth fruit. Thorns and briars. And then those thorns and briars are going to sprout more thorns and briars. They're going to produce seeds. And our whole country tonight, if we can look at it with spiritual glasses on, would just be covered in weeds and thorns and briars. It would be like choking out anything that's righteous and holy. It would be thorns uh, just infesting our country. When it ought to be an orchard of fruit trees, of Christianity, of soul winning, it's instead becoming overrun by thorns and briars that are choking out the truth, choking out Christianity, choking out morality. You say, what's the point of the sermon? Well, I'm trying to teach you something, but and I have so much more. I have like notes. I mean, I have I I literally went through half of my list here of what I wanted to talk about. There's so much on this subject, but but let me say this. What I'm trying to say is you've got to come to the place in your life when you realize that there are bad, bad people out there. Don't be naive. Don't put your hand in the sand. There's wicked people. Their only goal in life is to molest somebody and abuse somebody and hurt somebody and ruin somebody's life. Say, do you love them? I don't love them. I hate them. I hate the enemies of the Lord. That's what the Bible teaches. And so I don't hate my enemies. I love my enemies, but God's enemies, I hate them. The bad tree, I hate them. You don't love the flowers, you hate the weeds. And you know what? If somebody was abusive to my children, and you say, I love that person, I think he's a good guy on the inside, that would make me sick to hear that. He's not good. He's bad. And I'm going to tell you something. Please, for, all, for everything, please, just if you get one thing from the sermon, understand that you can't let your kids out of your sight. You can't just... You can't just let your niece and nephews or try to try to do whatever you can to keep your kids in your sight at all times because I'm telling you what, it's the people you least expect. Isn't it always the uncle? You know, like the molesting uncle that I have in my family. Everybody you talk to, it's always the uncle. It's always the PE coach. It's always the Sunday school teacher or the bus driver. You can't always tell by looking at the tree what kind of tree it is. But later on you'll see the fruit. But then it might be too late. I'm telling you, you've got to be sober. You've got to be vigilant. You've got to realize there's wicked people out there. You've got to realize what they are. That cute little sodomite at your work. He's just kind of a nice guy. He's just kind of a sweet guy. He's an animal. Some of them look harmless. They look friendly. You know? They wiggle around, and they're cute. It's, it's funny, right? We laugh about it when it's on TV. Oh, the guy's acting like a girl. Ha, ha, ha. All the way back to the 1950s. Oh, Bugs Bunny's wearing a dress and, and, and molesting Elmer Fudd. Ha, 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 ha. You remember that? Bugs Bunny. Anybody who's watched Bugs Bunny, Mary Melodies. Don't look at me like I'm crazy. He used to dress up in a dress, put on lipstick, 
and he would start kissing Elmer Fudd, and Elmer Fudd would start turning purple and green and other colors. You remember? Who, who remembers that? Put it around. He'd be turning, he's like sweating, like, and like Bugs Bunny is trying to kiss him, and he's dressed up like a girl, and it's supposed to be funny. There's nothing funny about it. There's nothing funny about the lives that are destroyed. There's nothing funny about a child being molested. There's nothing funny about people being abused. And then they try to come out with it and point these people out. And they say, you're lying. You're not telling the truth. You're making this up. Let's sweep it under the rug. Let's forget about it. Let's send you to a brat camp. Let's send you to a brat camp because you're saying that, that the pastor molested you. Or the saints. Hey, we need to wake up. These people are out there. They're everywhere. you got to be sober. you got to be vigilant. Don't laugh about it. There's nothing funny about it. That sweet little faggot at your work is an animal. He's a bad, bad tree, and all he wants to do is produce wicked, evil, corrupt fruit. Watch out for him. When I see these sodomites, I run screaming in the other direction. You say, are you homophobic? Yes, I am. I'm scared to death of them. Well, why don't you get in it? Why, you think Lot was homophobic? When he had him beaten on his door? You better know he was homophobic when he had somebody knocking on the door saying, hey, come on out here, Lot. We got the whole town here. We got a whole throng here. How did it get that way? As it was in the days of Lot, so shall it be also in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. <laughs> hey, how did it get that way? Because it went unchecked. And it kept multiplying and multiplying until every man in the city, small and great, was a sodomite. And they were all at Lot's door. Come on out, Lot. Come on out, Lot. You better know he was scared to death. Go to prison and see if you're scared of the queers. Be in a dark alley and tell me if you're not scared of these bunch of sodomites. Oh, the one I know is not like that. You better know he is. The Bible says he is. Oh, no, he's a really sweet guy. He's just a really cute guy. He's just a little girly. Wrong. He's a filthy animal. Now, I told you it wasn't going to be the most well-put-together sermon. My outline's kind of messed up. It's not three points in a poem at all. And, you know, I'm not the best preacher in the world, you know? I mean, a lot of people like preach a lot better than me, but you know what? I'm the person that's telling you the truth right now. You're going to have a hard time proving anything that I just preached in the Bible wrong. And if every preacher in America preached this sermon tonight, America would be a different place. And your kids would be a lot safer, and my kids would be a lot safer. But you know, my kids are going to be safe. Until they pull me away and throw me in the back of the paddy wagon, my kids are going to be safe. Because they're not going out of my sight and out of my wife's sight. Let's go.